Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies for their co-sponsorship. Disambiguated forms, dematerialized body parts, always gendered, set an agentive motion in unexpected ways, and the deconstruction of the art of the miniature. This is, a, is, this is the distinctive signature of Sikandar's art practice. Her works are a reminder that we live amidst the debris, the detritus of imperial world-making across the ages, and that we must work with these decomposed parts and elements and recombine them in the interest of remaking ourselves. There's an incredible anecdote about Shazia viewing black and white photographs while she was training in Lahore, uh, of viewing black and white photographs of miniatures that had been ripped out of folios and dispersed across colonial collections, and then painting them in color without knowing what they really looked like. And yet, when one looked at her miniatures, they called out their original in color, composition, and shape an uncanny resemblance between what was stolen and her acts of restitution. This is remarkable. It poses the question of craft. How do you know what something should look like? We're also having this conversation with Shazia today in the face of efforts across the subcontinent and especially in India to wipe out the histories, the memory and the very bodies that testify to a millennial record of hospitable life insurgent debate and artistic imagination. We live alongside ongoing mutations of empire and its technologics of extinction, of annihilation. In Shazia's work, we see their terrifying beauty as so many recurrent forms. Saturated with brilliant color, they defamiliarize what we know. They set histories in motion, acquiring new ways of seeing along the way. To look, and to see. Shazia's distinctive visual vocabulary was developed by embracing and inhabiting the traditional practice of miniature painting as if it was a plan and a prelude to exploding the miniature painting and the ways of seeing that it demands from us and to do so from within, to experiment with what such deconstruction and deformation enabled. Let me start by noting only the most significant accolades in a career that's been marked by the astonishing reach and range of her aesthetic practice. One that defines Shazia's engagement with the tradition in which she was trained by pushing it to its very limits. As if love demands dispersion, disillusion, and defacement. She's the recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship and the State Department Medal of Arts, and, the work, and her work has been exhibited widely at the Whitney, the Cooper, uh, the Cooper Hewitt, the Guggenheim Bilbao, Maxi in Rome, to name just a few sites, and it's been collected internationally. Shazia Sikandar Extraordinary Realities opened at the Morgan Library in New York last June to extraordinary acclaim and went on to the RISD Museum where she was trained. And it's currently at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas. Her work hangs at Princeton University, and there was a recent exhibition at Jesus College, Cambridge, about her work. I was alerted to Shazia's work when she, was, when she exhibited at the University of Chicago's Renaissance Society many years ago now, in 1998, by a dear friend. And I've been following her work since, a fangirl. Some years ago, we hosted a memorable conversation with her about her work with MoMA's Glenn Lowry, and fellow academics in the journal I edited for nearly a decade called Comparative Studies in South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. The university and this matter of training, of disciplining the body and training the hand and the eye is important. It's important uh, for our broader theme of mass intellectuality, and it's important to discuss in terms of Shazia's own work. The National College of Art, where Sikandar trained, used to be called the Mayo School of Industrial Art. Shazia's teacher, Bashir Ahmed, was responsible for creating a university curriculum for craft knowledge, which was typically imbibed through lifelong apprenticeship. I was waiting for her, Bashir Ahmed says in an interview. 
As we know, there's a long history in South Asian performative and artistic traditions of the uneasy place of the female ustad, the master practitioner. She is both within and without the genealogy. Her origins are disavowed only to be reclaimed later. Now this appears not to have been the case with Bashir Ahmed and Shazia herself offers a brilliant reading of elite versus lower middle-class culture in Lahore and the languages in use to mark those distinctions to explain Bashir's own intrusion into the NCA and what this meant for rewriting the art historical canon in which she was trained. But I'd like to return to the question of gender and the sexuate. There's persistent attention to gendering in Shazia's work. It's generative. New forms are lying in wait within the narrative practices of the miniature painting. Space-time blasted open to insert the gopi's hair, the tendrilled feet, and the wide hips of sexed signification, as if she is going deep into the miniature and pulling out those objects, items, body parts that haven't been seen properly before. Shazia notes the physicality of her training, how the knowledge of the hands must be developed as if they are themselves the eyes that imagine aesthetic form. The body of the artisan of craft labor as something standing between intellectual and manual labor is surely interesting here. And it's one of the things I hope we can discuss further with Shazia after her presentation today. Bringing miniature into the university altered the perceptual and the political field and Shazia was its catalyst. In her wake, students came to a newfound appreciation of color, light, and the line. Curves, swirls, tendrils, arabesques, elements that pull us into the miniature. The narrative, color, light, if this is what makes the miniature an Islamic form associated with the Mughal Karkana or the Atelier, it is also a form that associates us or the miniature with early modern worlding. To inhabit and embody this form is to refigure subcontinental geohistory. So I've mentioned empire, abstraction, or better yet, the dematerialization and recombination of forms, which is Shazia's distinctive signature, and the embodied discipline of miniature painting. Scale is important and Shazia plays with it in all her work. We perceive the miniature, but we don't often see it. We know that the work of adorning and embellishing exists, but rarely do we see the miniature up close. By playing with scale, by zooming in and zooming out, working between miniature and what's been termed uh, intimate immensity through an iterative return to form, there is here a meditation on the question of the material existence of the world. Shazia does this, I suggest, in two, perhaps three ways. One, she works along two axes. The axis of traditional miniature painting and another which cons consistently interrupts, annotates, and elaborates on it, shocking the system, you might say. My miniatures often have insertions of two time planes, she says. One plane is a meticulously painted surface crafted with a precision that's in keeping with the tradition. The other is its violation. The second, and something that's quite remarkable in uh, the artwork, is the act of naming and renaming these new forms. Who's veiled anyway? Eyeing those armorial beings, segments of desire go wandering off, no fly zone, sly offering, uprooted order, the many faces of Islam. These are just some of the titles of the work. They call our attention to both the practices of naming and recombining. That's the signature of Shazia Sikandar's work. Recent installations where the senses are engaged through sight and sound, through the immersive experience of the museum space and through her digital media work, gestures to Shazia's experimental practice, and they suggest new departures in experimenting with sense perception, but at a different scale 
as if the world demands that we see in this way now. Here is a shift in practice that's worthy of note and perhaps a conversation as well. There's much more to say about the intellectual force and the sheer aesthetic pleasure of Shazia Sikandar's work as she keeps opening new frontiers for exploration. But I don't wanna stand between our audience and our artist. She'll present and discuss work for about half an hour before we open up for Q&A. Shazia, thank you again, immensely so, for joining us today. Wow, thank you, Anu. That was um, really very beautiful. I, I really appreciated your very thoughtful insight into my practice. And I'm so honored to be here today uh, with the ICLS to be part of the annual conference, Mass Intellectuality. I will share my screen, so bear with me for a minute. I think through my hand, drawing has been an integral part of my art. Drawing allows thinking to take place. It creates an armature of research, clarification of ideas, and connects thinking to gesture, to action, to practice. It also allows collaboration to foster. For example, for my animated works, drawing often functions as the libretto. Drawing implies movement in time and across formats and mediums. It's a means of imagining and bringing forms to life. Space, velocity, magnitude, direction, all essential elements inherent in the process of drawing become active in different ways through thought and action through animation and music by linking time-based mediums to the act of thinking. There's movement, both literal and symbolic, as in the crossovers between man and nature, human and animal, plant and animal, geometry and bodies, male and female. There are no binaries. It is the in-between space that is fecund precisely because of absence. Absence or the untranslatable, the unknowable. The idea of mystery is a generative project in my practice. It is a resistance to the expected. It slows down the consumption of each work keeping it open-ended while being precise, making the viewer search for what can't be found. This absence is really what drew me um, to, towards the Central and South Asian manuscripts and how they were historicized in, um, and, and the literature around it. So this, this kind of desire, the curiosity to learn more early, exposure, as um, uh, Anu um, mentioned, was often through catalogs printed by the West. So this in the 80s was a time when, you know, there was very little circulation of books and um, the books were restricted or few available, but they were mostly from British Library or British Museum and, uh, or maybe an occasional book from uh, the Met, or I think I, I remember Howard Hodgkin's private collection of Indian paintings. And so a handful of books that I was uh, able to look at. And mostly if they were under lock and key in Bashir Ahmed's uh, um, studio. So often he would Xerox them and give um, hand over black and white Xeroxes. So I would study the form and in that um, kind of understanding of the form initially was how I first came to uh, a grasp, an intuitive grasp of uh, the 
of this genre, which for me felt incredibly intelligent and uh, which was kind of quite different to how a lot of the text would accompany the paintings. It was often incredibly descriptive and um, literal. And I could imagine immense possibilities in, in, the, in the images that I saw, even though access to the real objects was very, very little, hardly present. So this is sort of one example of the book. And this would be an example of a uh, Xerox copy. So my version looking primarily at the uh, black and white copy, which is at the Mets collection. But this sort of focus on the form um, allowed me to really think about um, scale and space uh, very differently. It didn't matter if the painting was small, it was very heroic in space. So um, these polarizing dichotomies that have long existed, such as East-West, Islamic Western, Asian White, oppressive free, encountering such prevalent binaries themselves, especially in the early 1990s, led to an outburst of androgynous forms, fragmented bodies, headless torsos, and self-rooted floating half-human figures that refuse to belong, to be fixed, or to be stereotyped. So many female icon iconographies from comical to dark started resisting categorization. I was responding to my inability to locate brown, South Asian representation in the feminist space in 1990s art world and art history books. You know, the monolithic category, third world feminism was incredibly limiting, but at the same time, it was fertile ground for me to, to start thinking outside of those uh, limitations. So experimenting with ink, mixed media techniques with a certain swiftness and abandon using different pressures, different types of brushes, I started painting abstractly with ink, gouache, watercolor. Gestural marks began to suggest recognizable, often figurative shapes. It was a process of working from memory, as well as the intense study of historical manuscripts. So I wasn't really following any particular script of how to respond to my interest to the manuscripts but to work very intuitively. It came out of many um, you know, um, encounters with, with research material, but also memories of that material, experiences combined with syncretic sculpture, South and Central Asian schools of paintings, such as Fahari, Safavid, Mughal, calligraphy, I, the sort of knitting together of all these references and mythologies, as well as more private inner encounters, dreams, fantasies, they gave birth to an exploration of forms which became incredibly feminine. So this repertoire of forms and figures also emerged during period when I would create multiple numerous fast gestural ink drawings each week. Suggestive forms were later given definition and supplied often with um, appendages, typically using additional material. So the, these resulting characters, sometimes androgynous, sometimes monstrous, repeatedly entered my work, frequenting as a collection of alter egos. So I would often say that these figures addressed the lack of female artists represented in art history and the art world and the misogyny women encounter in almost all spheres of work and life. So the act of drawing became about converting erasure into opportunity through wit and candor. So forms, um, this idea of form, like for me, this process of locating a relationship to tradition was not to mimic, but to regurgitate all that I had devoured while researching and learning. What is originality? How does one create something anew? Imaginative possibilities abound within the world itself, not just within the realm of the mind. So this idea that the world is full of mystery, containing within it a variety of distances between the real and the imagined. 
So I'm interested in that type of history, in politics, and also in the dynamism of the form itself. Form as something alive and in conversation with its time, space, and language. So um, th these uh, these works are uh, over a different sort of different stretch of time, but I wanted to also show you how I um, started dissecting these coffee table styled big luxurious books, which often you would find on um, Indian art or Islamic art. And um, they almost always had these types of categories broken down into ceramics, weapons, calligraphy, miniatures. And um, the more I observed, the more I started imagining these shadowless representations of bowls, jewelry, objects such as swords, vessels, cannons, amulets, masks, as these little monsters that I could animate and thus allow them to step out of the books into their own power. So for me, this was like a very inventive and ironic play on the colonial histories of dispersing, rupturing, archiving, cataloging, and institutionalizing art and artifacts of native cultures. So as I was developing these conversations, I was also very interested in, in um, engaging other artists. So some of the early works that were literally very collaborative in nature and were done uh, on the same pieces of paper were with um, the late artist Donna Maria Brut Bruton and the collaborative work with her right here was done in, in the early 90s. So we both shared concerns about the white art world and patriarchal structures as women of color at that time. Another example, uh, this work called Housed, here the haunted image uh, responded to, um, was my response to the Orientalist obsession with the veil in the Western imagination. So I wanted to question it. So I sort of painted it, is it, a, is it perforated armor? Is it a shelter? Is it a mask or a shell? For me, this, this sort of this idea was coming from the constraints of escaping and imprisoning representation. The cage-like form has a door. It has a pink heart that lurks inside. This painting also tapped into my anxiety of being boxed into a stereotype on behalf of a culture or a religion. Another example, separate working things, which is about um, how I was looking at very um, at uh, tropes or uh, temp, uh, kind of um, stock characters like the lovers on horseback and then trying to sort of explore them or rupture them and here the painting is um, the, the painting as well as its uh, extended mosaic destabilizes the motif of heterosexual love itself and it's this sort of obliteration that's happening with this uh, kind of gesture of a sunburst, which was directly um, sort of, which was painted on a separate uh, um, acrylic sheet. And then the painting, which was very meticulously first painted, then, then this image was placed on top and it was passed through a etching press. So I wasn't sure what would happen, how that, how these two surfaces would collide and what would happen. It could have totally created an erasure of all the labor that had existed in my earlier work. So these tensions that were happening were actually physically happening also in, in the process itself. Um, another example here is uh, this idea of this sort of obliteration, but also creating characters, mythic characters that play to this image of the poltergeist. Um, so this one called Ready, Ready to Leave. In, in, this, in this series, Uprooted Order, um, here I think the, 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 what, what I was trying to do was build the idea of the feminine as an apparatus of power. So removing, keeping Radha, but removing um, Krishna from the equation to focus on Radha's power. And also um, 
here you can see that she, that there is another element of this kind of ghost-like character that is placing the foot on the roots of the ghost figure. So I was also thinking about um, how to address the fallacy of assimilation versus foreignness. So um, you know these are these are paintings which were happening when I was when I was living in Houston, and uh, with its very multiple immigrant narratives and nationalism. So it had it was outside of uh, the very closed boxed in time as a MFA student in Providence. Continuing uh, with another painting, Pleasure Pillars, here the, these pageants of archetypes, they celebrate both female sensuality and desire and the self, so sort of the self-central self-portrait with the ram's horns is also suggestive of commonalities and multiplicity and basically a state that is always becoming. So here I would quote um, uh, Gayatri Gopinath who wrote about this work in my recent book, Extraordinary Realities, where she talks about it as a response to the paternalistic justifications for the war in Afghanistan as saving Muslim women. So this work points to the joyous sensual depictions of feminine power and um, which Led, leads me to another series of work called Intimacy, where I uh, borrowed the title from Guy Three's essay and looked at these paintings that I had made more than 20 years ago with the interest to see what would happen if the painting could become a sculpture. So that leads to uh, promiscuous intimacies. And um, that um, this idea of the sculpture um, entangled with, uh, with the Greek or Roman Venus and the Indian Devata was also exploring um, uh, promiscuous intim intimacies of multiple times, spaces, art, historical traditions, bodies, desires, and subjectivities. But it was also interesting to see how my work was now being read through the lens of queer uh, theory. And these are these are incredibly um, productive communications and uh, put, uh, generative placements, because I've always struggled with how the traditional art world writes about my practice. It often gets straightjacketed in terms of my biography, even though all of this work I have created by living, living in the US where I've been living since 93 um, for, you know, for, for the last 20 years, I am still often seen as the outsider, as if the work is being made elsewhere, somewhere else, wherever that may be, you know, and it, and, and even though I, I, my early works often come up, but, you know, the, the, um, I, I was a student with Bashir Ahmed in the late 80s. So, so it's always very exciting for me when, when, um, when I get to engage with another thinker, a writer, um, a poet, and be able to really reflect also at the iconographies that are present in my work. And, and, it, and that usually is generative in the sense that it allows me to create new work. So here, this is promiscuous intimacies is really an example of that, like how uh, the, um, the protagonists in the paintings uh, lent, just sort of came alive as, uh, as archetypes. And, um, and of course there is, you know, there is having seen this show, having read this book, look, my interest in, um, in kind of, also uh, other outsiders, uh, outsider aesthetics to classical um, uh, art like mannerism. So all of these um, influences kind of intuitively were uh, present in that sketch that I had done 20 years ago. But when I created the, um, the sculpture, that those ideas came alive in a very different complex way. And that I think is really how I think of my practice about 
being, you know, like critical thinking, creativity, collaboration are the three tenets on which my understanding is built of being an artist, how culture, society, economy intersect and how communities coalesce. It plays a huge role in how art functions in overlapping spaces. So issues around gender, sexuality, language, empire, they have all been present in various degrees in my process of thinking and making. And for me, um, the function of art is really to allow multiple meanings and possibilities to open up space for a more just world. So beginning in the 1980s, my work pioneered a visual art form, which now is often called as new miniature, bringing into dialogue Central and South Asian manuscript painting traditions with contemporary international art practices. So this interest in uh, pre-modern manuscripts was sparked in response to a prevalent dismissive attitude, as well as my own curiosity to learn about pictorial vernaculars that were not from Western painting canon. So transforming miniature painting status from traditional and nostalgic to a contemporary idiom became my very personal goal after my thesis, the scroll, which I, which you see here, uh, where I'm just starting it. Um, it was created 1989 to 90. It broke open the mold for what could be considered a quote unquote contemporary miniature. So I carried this burden as a young artist for a long time when engaging with the Indo-Persian miniature genre was not familiar in the contemporary, contemporary international art world. So art history is so deeply Eurocentric and it tends to place art that is outside, that is outside of its own canon as always the other, but never avant-garde. And this term avant-garde has, has always been reserved for art that's within the Western art history construct and criticism. So for example, when I was conceptually deconstructing pre-modern manuscripts and their Western scholarship without abandoning the interest and my interest in the inherent techniques at a time when engaging craft-based traditions was neither hip nor cool, this was late 80s, you know, that was a very radical step for me as a very young artist when the regional status of miniature painting was mired in tour sketch. So I would argue that this work, um, the scroll, was uh, avant-garde, that my work was engaging the pictorial traditions that still do not sit comfortably in the center of Western art history. And precisely because of those reasons, you know, how the work gets talked about is often very um, simpli sim simplistic and often about identity. So initially, this is, this is basically how I got started. And, um, you know, uh, what brings me to the point that I'm making is that my work has been seen through the lens of a Pakistani, a female, a Muslim artist, and an Asian first. And um, such opaque and broad projections emphasize the work as that of the outsider from another culture, robbing the work of any meaningful and critical read and instead being substituted by um, very essentialist approaches. So this, this, I, this I kind of raise as a question also because at what point it are these differences and um, these, these sort of lines of divisions and segregation that exists for a certain type of aesthetic going to exist in, in our world, you know? Um, because my commitment to miniature painting also stems from my desi desire to diversify a predominantly Eurocentric art history and to also question the entrenched organizing principles of museums, 
with regard to what is considered quote unquote contemporary or what is considered historical. So some of my works have been um, it, it, I, like at the Philadelphia Art Museum, um, the work it is now permanently situated in the historical South Asian art galleries. And, um, and oftentimes, you know, the work is, is will be placed very much in the contemporary section. And there's always this sort of um, unease amongst the curators in terms of where and how to place my work. And for me, this is, in, this is very empowering and generative. It's not limiting because I have been pushing these boundaries for so long. Um, anyway, so I wanted to just bring this up because I do want to pose this question that who gets to talk about visual artists' works? What happens if there is no language available to talk about it, especially at the time of the making of the art? And what is the dynamic of the power in the art world and the art history world that shapes the rhetoric around artists and um, art, especially art created by artists of color? And what happens when art is multivalent and can belong in various categories, but the predominant ways of discussion remain fairly opaque and binary oriented. So just quickly, a few things that I wanted to um, just point out. So this, you see this red fence in the background. I kind of played on this idea because there will always be a, a, a kind of a separation between the spiritual world and the uh, imagined world in Safavid painting. So I was, there was this red kind of fence differently painted, but I think of this fence as a departure, almost like as a line. And I have worked, I have taken that notion and played with it in multiple ways. So then here line almost becomes um, a response, a spontaneous response to a difficult situation. Um, it is also about authority as an approximation. It can also be very much about a stalemate. So line becomes this idea that goes beyond, um, beyond uh, um, geography and scale and space and history. And it's almost for me, when I'm thinking of line, I'm thinking of a way in which how I can make my painting into a poem. This is another example of the X, which is uh, created by writing with both English and Urdu and converging both of those gestures till, uh, till they sort of bleed into each other. Another example of this idea of line as an editing tool um, is in this painting, Who's Failed Anyways. So it was in the US that I became aware of the very long history of the politicization of the veil in the politics of the West, especially Europe and its colonial legacy. It functioned as a battleground for different ideologies at times of crisis, staged unveilings in French Algeria, for example, women choosing not to wear it as per their own will or choosing to wear it as in the 1970s in Egypt as a sign of rejection of Western consumerism to mandatory veiling and public banning in certain countries. So anyway, my idea that this sort of vested power, which is contradictory over time in the shifting meaning of the form in its public debate prompted me to question who is veiled anyways. But this was also something that you couldn't avoid. So it wasn't like, oh, the only way to get attention in the West is to start making veils, which was often a criticism you would hear. It is something which was incredibly prevalent, which would, which post 9-11 has even become more so where, you know, this idea of this definition of this Muslim woman is always happening outside uh, and independent of one's experience. And I would often be um, seen through that lens or that image would be projected onto me. So there, so there was no way to avoid it. I knew that I had to deal with it and confront it. And 
And, and my confrontations could be contradictory or they could take on as many shapes as, as, a, as a thinker, I had to think through it. So just as an example of this particular painting, what you see is the before and after. So I painted with this white line as the editing tool right over um, this figure. So when you take a magnifying glass, you will see that under the white line, which may resemble a feminine iconography, but may not, is the male figure. So I was playing with Helen Sissou's idea of the ecriture feminine, often called white ink. The usage of white was also referencing the foundational element of the gadrang, which is the opaque color technique in miniature painting. White is used as the body for all colors. So using white paint as an editing tool to write with literally and conceptually was also a play on redaction and on who gets to define the other in the collective imaginary. So whose histories are being de determined by those in positions of power, whether colonial, imperial, or nationalistic hierarchies. And femininity to me is thus very much the tension between women and power. How society perceives such a dynamic between power and women and how erasure is enacted by social forces that shape women's lives. This is another work, Kindred, which also refers to Octavia Butler, but the ocean here is created with Urdu text, Ghalib's verse, which kind of loosely talks about the very immense and the very fragile and their interdependence. But you can also see that it is a very uncanny resemblance to a photographic satellite image of clutter, human clutter in space. So which is the image on the right that I just shared. So this, what, this kind of relationship happened much later. I, uh, once I'd made it, then, then I was just shocked at how uncanny that resemblance was. Um, so these, this idea of, uh, of uh, redemption or um, continuing this theme of redemptive, redemp redemptive powers of the female body as a counter to the extractive forces of global capital. So here you can see um, a series of, of paintings. They are fairly recent that I made, which play with this uh, construction of a Christmas tree, which is basically another term for the oil rigs. And, but they did not look like Christmas trees. I kind of took that term, which is a British term from British petroleum magazines and kind of created uh, these, these trees, which again, you know, they, 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 they for me are also symbols of, ex of extraction. And also there is inherent paradox, the rising waters, the ecological situations that mirror our social conditions, the erosion of climate, of borders, and um, of displacement of bodies. So the, these, these large paintings are again in ink and gouache and they are on paper. And um, this leads me into um, Parallax, which is a animated, I'll share that as one example of my animated uh, drawings. So Parallax was produced for the Sharjah Biennial in, in 2013. And it's an extended meditation on the ebb and flow of cultures and histories localized at the Strait of Hormuz, weaving together images that range from, um, from my Indo-Persian inspired paintings to contemporary landscapes that uh, were often that I, I painted directly from in my visits and research trips in Sharjah. So the operatic compositions that, that are accompanied are created by the composer Duyan. And with they also have epic poems from Sharjah based poets. So this video's luminous sort of imagery with layers of music and spoken word. They expand this core theme of oil extraction migratory flows and climate change. So um, I worked from drawings, hundreds of drawings, watercolors, animation cells, and then the sweeping plunging shapes, they lead um, 
uh, that are that are very creative from fluid material like ink itself. They actually uh, allow almost like the possibility of animation. So it's not subservient to a software, but it's very much driven by the act of drawing itself. And for me, you know, very much within the animation itself, the idea of oil is also as if how the ink drips. So as the oil is oozing out of all these perceived orifices, and these are the cracks in the gouache. So the so I'm playing with ink as if it's um, another material. So I was linking material with matter, drawing with thinking and power with natural resources. And, um, and th this is another way, another thinking tool on the possibilities of drawing. And so from Parallax, what happened is I, I, was, uh, I thought that I could turn this cinematic idea upside down and what would happen if that space suddenly became a very vertical idea and how would form and color and politics and the materiality uh, coalesce together. So this is, um, this is, I'm gonna end here, but this is sort of the glass and stone mosaic at the Princeton University, a 70 foot prominent public art commission. And, but for me, glass was a very natural direction as much of my work deals with transparency and light. And what, what led me to mosaic was also the idea of the digital pixel. So the pixel could equate into the unit of the mosaic. Once I've made that connection, then mosaic became full of possibilities. It became a very contemporary, alive material. And I was not interested in creating um, um, a kind of going into mosaic just by getting it fabricated or reproduced or my images being reproduced through color through number type of uh, construction. So it's a very hands-on engagement where I, I want to understand the dynamic of the mosaic, how to keep it ungrouded, how for it to be full of life, and to really then um, play with the elasticity of drawing and to rethink the drawing to accommodate the material. And so I created um, full-scale full scale drawings before uh, um, creating the mosaic. And um, just wanted to share a little bit of these images that will give you an idea of uh, some of the work happening in the studio. I am happy to end here, Anu, so that we have time to engage further. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak about my work. Shazia, this is absolutely extraordinary. Um, and um, I will just pick up on a couple of things and uh, then allow people time to ask questions. Um, a part of, I think all of us feels like we just want to keep watching and seeing and being with the work. But you start by saying, I think through my hand, drawing allows research to take place. Space, velocity, direction, gesture, action is kind of animated, revived. And you speak about the form as being alive and time as movement. And within this, it seems to me, you bring up the question of the gendered, and the monstrous. And I was really reminded by Horton Spiller's point that female flesh is ungendered. So it exists, it's a kind of existent that alters, interrupts the very frame, the space, um, the kind of material space, it kind of X marks the spot and it's open for experiment and experimentation. And I think this, this the point that you made got me thinking about the relationship, of course, between gender and the human, but also the ways, the kind of profound ways in which you're thinking about the body in and of the material world, uh, questions of material existence, writ small and writ large. And I think that's what one sees in the art practice that you spoke about. There are two particular things that I just merely wanted to either point to or ask you about. 
Um, one is this question of the line. We had talked a little bit about it and I had asked and said, what is the sort of, you know, a line is a way of signifying the relationship between a physical universe and a social and a spiritual universe. And you speak about the line as enclosure, as a mode of editing, that is altering the line, going beyond the line and what we saw uh, in whose, uh, whose veiling anyways, or whose veil it is any, whose veil is it anyways, uh, as approximation, as stalemate, as the line of control. Um, I'm very interested in this, in the grammar or the philosophy of the line. I'd love to hear you say a little bit more about it. Um, I think it's profound, the ways in which it's influenced your practice. And it's the line, but it's also the circle. And you're always working between the one and the other. So the circle in terms of the globe, in the englobement, as it were, of world and possibility, the gopi's hair. So the ways in which the line seems to become the circle, seems to become something else. Um, and I find that quite remarkable. The second um, question was sparked by seeing you present some of your more recent work. And I guess that's about material, materials, materiality, and kind of hardness, softness. You show us the bronze. You speak about the mosaic as approximating the pixel. There is the digital media work and song, which is ephemeral. So I would love to hear you say something about the qualities, the physical qualities, the infrastructural qualities, speaking about parallax and those Christmas trees as well, and modes of extraction about softness and hardness, um, if I may. But those are my questions to you. There's one other question and I'll just um, relay that to you as uh, we wait. Um, Rafia Zakaria says, thank you for a remarkable presentation indeed. Um, I'd like to hear you speak further about being a brown woman in America, where the concept of race often reduces itself to black or white with nothing in between. So different kinds of questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so God, the, these are amazing questions. And I'll, um, I will first say, you know, when I uh, look at manuscripts, and you know, I'm not looking at any one particular type. I'm, I'm greedy. I want to look at everything, so I don't have any discrimination. I, it's always not. It's never that simple. So it requires if you have access to the storages, say you go to the storage at the Met and you get to spend two three hours looking at actual material. It is a very visceral experience. I, I am just it gives me goosebumps. I, whatever it is, it might be in one's DNA or it is inherent in these incredible um, artworks that look as if they were painted yesterday. And they're full of information and detail and you really can spend years with just one work. There's so much material. Um, and so when I, when I think of that, I never think of them as precious small objects that, that can be put aside because they're tiny or they're small. I examine their line, I examine the color, I examine the form, and I always, they are buzzing at the edges. They are always hinting at a bigger, greater world. And, and when you think of it in that way, then you really start to think of the time in which they were created. And, the, and then you, you have to understand the time and history and the politics of that particular period, the patronage and the global and the dynamic in the world. What was happening you know, in 1600 in, in India and what would be happening in Europe in 1600. And if I then, then I can, then it gives me the freedom to look at um, maybe an attributed artist because sometimes some of these paintings, you don't know who painted them and the attributions have come later. So if you look at uh, somebody and then you're studying their work and then like, oh, that looks, that reminds me of El Greco. So when I then will look at El Greco and 
I, in this time and age, am free to imagine that maybe they were lovers. Maybe they knew each other. I can take that type of liberty. I do not need to be told that, no, the person painting the miniature was influenced by Europe. And that's it. And there is no other way to see it. So that was definitely the, these types of um, ways of thinking happened early, like when I was a teenager, when I was started get, digging into the manuscript tradition, I, ne I was excited, but I was frustrated. So it was this sort of, con this kind of contradiction that persists in terms of how we define art, in terms of how we uh, create hierarchies between high art and low art. And that brings me to your second question, like this tension. You know, this tension is something which is uh, fertile for me. So this play with the soft and hard, or this play with something which is incredibly precise to, to paint something like an illustrator, and yet to be able to have multiple associations present in that image. Like that's, a, that's not a simple thing to, to, to be able to do or to continuously reinvent or train yourself. So I'm really interested in that particular encounter that I give incredible definition and I give you precise detail, but my detail is not the detail of a decorative type. It's not, it's nano detail, but it's not an embellished detail. It's not just there for effect. It's there for thinking. And so you can come back and back to the painting and you can, you know, and how can I insert time into painting? How, what, how do you translate time? How do you paint time? What is time? How do you make something which is timeless? And so I think I often go back and back and forth into, into being inspired by poets and finding my inspiration into poetry for obvious reasons. And then coming to Rafia, Rafia's uh, question, I think it's really an important question. It has always been an important question, but I think currently right now I've been hearing it a lot because of course there is a different type of uh, visibility as Asians. And then there's an incredible invisibility also in, in a culture which is very black and white. So how do you, in, what do you do with that? How do you come to terms with it? It is, it, is a, it is a very serious, I think, question because it, it talks about, you know, like as a South Asian, then do you engage, are you, you are part of the South Asian diaspora, but the South Asian diaspora also has its boundaries and who's invited to be in it and who isn't. And then within it, there are other dynamics of, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the Hindu Muslim dynamics, the other political dynamics that are even as an example of like, of for a long time, I wanted to do research of manuscript paintings in India, but for the last so many years, I cannot get a visa to travel to India. So here you have to perform the intimacy of being a South Asian. So you have to speak to Indianness and to being a Pakistani, but the reality is quite different. And so how do you then be, be transparent in, in, in within the diasporic space as well? So my interest often is then how can I create generative space in the overlapping diasporas, especially you know, in the US where there's so much emphasis on hyphenated identities, then, then, then when, when I think of it in that way, then it becomes a solution where the overlaps are the places where, where there is, um, where, where, where it's like the, you know, the lacuna, the mystery, where you can step outside of your own sort of conditioning and engage with the other and create sort of new territories but but it is um it is definitely um you do see it like even for my even as an artist like being in the U.S. for whatever 20 plus years it took me 20 years to get a museum exhibition in New York City like the Morgan exhibition was after 20 years so, you know, so again, oftentimes the work constantly gets 
written about as if it's happening somewhere else, not in the US, though so much of my collaborative works have been with other American artists. So it, it is. I think, I think that's, that's, that's a kind of, you know, the question of displacement is not about substitution, but it is about constant displacement. And I think, as you said, exploring those spaces in between. I wanna also maybe pick up on Rafia's um, question and there's another one for you too, but to come back to this question of, of kind of solidarities or thinking through different kinds of diasporas, you started by showing us those portraits of Fanon and Angela Davis and Femi de Riaz. What's, what's going on there? I hadn't seen those and um, and you started with those. What's what's up with that? Um, that's one. And then let me read you the other question um, uh, from Tabisile Griffin. Dear Shazia, thank you so much for sharing your incredible work with us. Your methodological and visual interventions overflow with social confrontations, but also spiritual and philosophical self encounters that request individual introspection towards deeper understanding and movement. Can you talk about your own meditations and how they've changed through the course of your practice? How has your art changed you? What meanings and possibilities have opened up for you? What have you left behind? Oh yeah, oh, that's a very philosophical <laughs> take on, I think for me, I, I don't know. I think it's the same, like being waking up every day, it's the same sort of anxiety as if I have to start from scratch. I, I have always been like that. Like every day I have to be like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> and I have to like rethink everything. And it's never uh, satisfied by like just repeating something that, you know, and, and you know what, in that sense, it, sits outside it uh, it sits a little outside of the commercial art world because over there uh, kind of my way of making art and taking too many detours and doing research and doing things at my own pace and in a far slower pace it it's a it's a, it doesn't it doesn't sit well where where you have to sort of you know have an army of people making your work. <laughs> so it's right there and then. Things that have really been a radical change for me are to um, um, channel that frustration right into the work and um, be sort of, you know, be aware of clear, like, why is it that I make the art that I make? So. And I think that's, that's just self-growth. You keep pushing yourself and you keep growing and, and, um, and you're grateful for having, you know, having uh, creativity. Um, I was going to say that, yeah, you asked about the portraits. So that I just threw them in because I, there's so much more work. Of course, I can't show all of it. I have I have always had an interest in portraiture. I came to art as a, when I was a young kid, I used to make portraits of people because I was very quiet and very shy. And that was one way of, of like gaining somebody's attention or creating a bridge of communication. And um, I have done projects like with uh, Franz Morin, Quiet in the Land in Laos for a couple of years where there are 99 portraits of the novices over a long period of time when the novices kind of transition into monks. So that age between nine and 10 to 12 and 13 and the face changed. So there's a whole project on, on pushing portraiture. Um, but these I just threw in there just, just to be like more provocative. But I was thinking that, you know, um, juxtaposing Pakistani feminists, writers, poets, whether it was Famida Riaz's portrait you saw, but like uh, Kishwar Nahid or um, Isma Chuktai alongside Angela Carter or, or Chris Deva or Bell Hooks or Nancy Sparrow or Eva Hesse. Like these were exercises that I was very eager to do because I wanted to create the, these types of juxtapositions 
to understand feminist forms and in turn explore language from specific points and places of women's narratives. So, you know, so I, it's a, when I started to dislocate uh, these types of um, contexts and intimacies across race, then I opened up um, a different kind of framing devices. So miniatures usually have a center and a border. So the center margin dynamics are very much uh, a conceptual template. So I was thinking, how could I bring the periphery into the center? And what would happen if I could also... Um, um, so, so, so portraiture for me here is a thinking exercise. It's not about creating a likeness of the individual, but the individuals I chose are the ones that I was reading about, whose work was you know, inspiring me. So I was getting into their head, so I wanted to paint them, but I wanted to paint them in a manner that was that where Adrian Rich is not just Adrian Rich. She, she is more the Adrian Rich that perhaps was inspired by Ghazal. So, you know, so then it's a different interpretation of Adrian Rich. Just beautiful. Um, I, I want to go back to just, I just want to mark something that you said. You said that um, your details are for thinking. And this question of kind of meditative, you know, the meditation on form and the return. Um, I'm going to, to pick up and read to you many, many are comments um, about the work, but I think there is a question here as well. Al Alexandra Albero asks, thanks for your presentation. I love your work. Your practice seems to move continuously between pre-produced images and scribbled graffiti-like gestures. It seems to engage in fragmentation rather than continuity, dispersal rather than homogeneity, a multiplicity of positions rather than a univocal or condensed resolved form. Following Sixou's notion of écriture féminine, would you link this fragmentation and multiplicity to the representation or the articulation of the female body. And um, I will just read to you a couple of comments as well. Thank you, Shazia. This is Diane Chu for the informative and insightful talk on your works. Your creations are mesmerizing. Taranga Gunatilika asks, thank you so much for this presentation and for your honest views. I'm a brown artist, South Asian living in the US. Do you by any chance do consultations on Zoom or in person and goes on to ask? I often get asked why my work is it based on my culture simply by them knowing where I am originally from. I don't see, think that way. I've lived half my life in the US. I'm not sure how to escape these ways of people having the specific lens when they view my work. Um, there is one, there's another one on miniature and uh, medieval maps and so on. I will come back to that because I think there's plenty on the table for you. So I'll come back to the, to the miniature question. Yes. Yeah, so um, yeah, uh, let me just kind of re rethink what you, the person asking is, um, I, I, I agree and disagree. I think for me, um, when I, a fragmentation is, um, is also kind of dismemberment of form. And if I am digging deeper into the form, I, I will cut it up as, as many ways as I need to. Because when I reassemble it, it will, uh, it will always be, you know, it will always be from, it will, every time it will change. So this kind of way of, of engaging with form naturally led to thinking in time medium like animation and I was like okay if I can if I can really um, weave uh, this process through music and then I can have maybe another parallel narrative happening that's unfolding in a very different type of medium and space so um, but the experience for the viewer is is very whole like it's full, it's fully, it involves all your senses. So this idea of this, the process and the methodology of fragmentation, but the eventual the experience of the art is full. It's not fragmented. And that for me is really a very thoughtful, um, important uh, procedure that I am 
very invested in how the viewer experiences the work. It's very much about an experiential, initial experience and encounter that then allows the viewer to keep engaging with the with the work. And and that for that, you know, you, you for that you can't just fragment everything and then wish it that it will just magically <laughs> come together. You have to, it comes with like a lot of uh, practice, a lot of time, a lot of knowledge of, of the material, a, a lot of like um, failure and then a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of things have to fall in place for, for that moment, for, the, for that piece to 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 function and for me i think the armature is drawing so that's how i think of drawing is that that's that i will come back and resolve the problem through the drawing i will fix everything again through drawing so whether i you, whether i'm collaborating with a composer i my i'm speaking to them through drawing whether I'm talking with the poets who will layer the, the the who will layer their voices into the score, they they are communicating with my drawing, with my art. So that that's very important for me is that um, how the how, like the work should speak. It's great to have this opportunity to speak with you and to be able to to share one's ideas, but you know, but at the core of it is like, it's very, it doesn't do, it doesn't, it's always tough. It's always tough to talk about the art because <laughs> the art is really about the experience. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Um, there's a question by Karen Pinto and I was gonna jump onto that as well, but here's the question. Have you looked at miniatures of medieval Islamic maps in Arabic, Persian and Turkish manuscripts? I look forward to your interpretations Examples are available in my Chicago book on medieval Islamic maps. I loved your world map and cosmos interpretation and look forward to other possible map interpretations. I speak as another Pakistani woman studying and researching writing in the US since the 1980s. Thank you, Karen Pinto, CU alum uh, from PhD history uh, of 2002. And I think to Karen's um, point, and I think just kind of the, the question as well, um, of the medieval manuscript or manuscripts as your archive and the way that you speak about going in and looking at these manuscripts as a kind of archival base. I want to actually ask you, and then you spoke about uh, coming back and looking at Adrian Rich through, um, through Ghazal, you know, and what would this mean? And um, there's that extraordinary set of painting, which is the X marks the spot actually which on further um, kind of on a deeper view is, um, is poetry and it's Urdu and it's the reiteration of form as poetry, poetry as form, as geometric abstraction and or arabesque and so on. So taking you back to thinking about the tradition and language and writing itself, in the work of um, both the miniature and in your own work. Um, just kind of piggybacking on Karen's question as well, I think on, on this archive, which is actually your kind of base and foundation in many ways. Um, yeah, when, you know, when I'm thinking of the archive, I am really um, literally talking about the, the visual, like the, the manuscripts which have a huge amount of paintings in the folios. Much of it has been scattered and dismembered and dispersed. And um, that, that kind of, that idea of this kind of dispersion is something that, you know, that speaks to me because um, that, that's where I can understand and kind of think about history, that history itself is, kind of an account of these movements, right? Of these objects and the colonial legacy that 
then through which these objects and bodies, how they kind of travel through trade and slavery and migration and colonial occupation, how these sort of undercurrents are the root axis of modernity. So how that history is going to be told, who has the authority to tell it, it sort of, it exposes these types of the hierarchies of power. And, and when I think of that, then I am, I have more freedom to accept or not accept an account of how I'm supposed to read uh, the traditional manuscript paintings. Like I'm free to read them as I want to read them. I don't have to follow a certain kind of um, prescribed way by an art historian. So this sort of, <laughs> this is how I think of uh, my engagement with the archive. Um, Roz Morris has a question for you. Um, and um, thank you so much, Shazia. As always, listening to you is a revelation and a profound pleasure. The work rewards such repeated viewing, which leads me to the question of rhythm. How do you think of tempo and rhythm, not only in the animated works, where music and lyrics sometimes provide a momentum and temporal structure, but also in the drawings and paintings. Thank you, Roz. Um, yes, uh, this is a very empowering um, way of thinking about the possibility of drawing that it could collaborate with a composer that the drawing was, could be seen as a libretto and that the drawing itself had music and motion in it. So I think those things really started to happen when I myself was uh, wanting to um, step outside of my confines of my sort of like working isolated in my studio and how could I allow um, a collaborative bridge. And, and I think um, in recognizing that the potential lay again through my hand, like if I could, if this is what I wanted, I could then uh, focus on it and, and let it surface, you know, like this idea of, of rhythm, it just so, sort of will, would then surface as if it's rising through the water-based material. And, and then through particle system, it can be coded and kind of choreographed into further 3D movements. So I, I can, the imaginative kind of impulse is very much in, in a simpler means in the means of like thinking with the brush on a surface like paper and the, and the playfulness of ink and opaque and transparent watercolors. Those are, those are my tools. And, and then when I kind of, the ambition is, is pushes those tools. So that's how, that's how I think of this. Um, um, uh, yeah, like the drawing being able to uh, imagine a grander uh, possibilities for itself. I love what you say also that, you know, drawing is what you come back to to resolve a problem. That's where you solve the puzzle um, in some sense to, I think, also your, your point in response to Roz. Avinom Sholem has a question comment. Thank you for sharing with us your artistic experience and for your excellent talk about your own work. I was much intrigued by your use of the museum, its exhibition halls and, de uh, and uh, depot two departments too, as the field from which you draw your encyclopedic visual world. Can you add to this specific interaction in the museum space with past images? And especially the museum is a highly contested and highly critical space of colonial ideology. How is this visualized in your work? Um, can I share my screen? Of course, please. Okay. okay, so. As Roz said, you know, repeated viewing is the greatest <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> okay, this is so um, wonderful. Thank you, all of you. 
for. So I am, I didn't get to this point, but it's a, it's a great way for me to maybe talk about what you just asked. So here, you know, here in the vitrine is the manuscript that Philadelphia Museum owns. I was, I, they wanted to bring it out of their storage and, and find a way to find a new audience for it. So I was invited to engage with it. And it was, I, for the first thing I thought of was how did the museum get this piece? It wasn't like, oh, what's a piece about? So the provenance of the object is really important to me. And yet as an artist, I am, I am connected to the object. So I am interested in the object also. And the only, like my way, I wasn't there to make a documentary on, on the provenance of this object and, quest, and see how the museum um, um, acquires a certain object. So the, the problematics with many of these objects are given, they exist. And, and at the same time, so many of such manuscripts are dismembered. So here was a very unique opportunity that the, the entire book existed in its entire form which is a very rare situation. Usually different pages are in different museums. So, so that was one way where I was like, I could see the sequential nature of how the artist had painted um, a narrative. But the other problem was that the text was in Dakani Urdu with like more than three or 4,000 verses. And nobody sort of, there was, there is no kind of translation of that. So there was a one page synopsis in English of, uh, of what the story is. And I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna imagine the story based on my interpretations of the visuals. And I will leave aside that story and then, and then take a very different dive into the piece. And, and if you trust me, then I will kind of, you know, create a response to this work. So I created a facsimile. So you can, on the left, this guy is looking through the entire facsimile, beautifully produced. And you can like see through, you can see the piece. And then the interpretation or the response called disruption as rapture is also adjacent where in this altar-like space, you can sit there and um, see the piece and, and hear it. And then later I was, what I was able to do was, um, I was able to share this work outside of the museum. Let me see if I can get to that. I, I Hazel, can you can you please just go back and show us those last three images as well? They went by pretty fast. Okay. Uh, so this piece we show we showed it at the Lahore Fort in Pakistan, where the um, the music was made even the score was even made more porous and uh children's choirs were invited to participate in the score and so the the beauty of this uh kind of project was that i was able to share this very precious manuscript in a different manner in it's all in in it becomes alive in a very different way around the world. So here, um, uh, the, uh, it, the whole piece was performed live and we invited other people. Then it was also seen as a separate um, LED large scale public installation in an in a area which is frequented by all different class uh, communities and very pedestrian and then also at the you know, at the Nuit Blanche Festival, which is a very different context. So once, so I found a way for, for the work to exit the restrictions or the fortress idea of the museum and, um, and, and be able to, you know, uh, put that into the contract so that the work could exist outside in different ways. So that, Oops. Shazia, are you there? Shazia, 
she'd been afraid that um, her internet was a little bit unstable. Um, maybe we'll wait for a minute. I um I wonder if we're not able to get her back. Um yeah, I think she was um maybe kicked off. So um maybe this is an apt end to um so the artist goes missing <laughs> um as we bid her goodbye. Um but I'd like to thank you all for joining us and um Shazia uh, Sikandar, thank you immensely for the generosity of your time, for um, speaking with us, and for this remarkable presentation today. I think she's back. Shazia, we were thanking you in, in absence. I said that artist has gone missing. Um, <laughs> I am so sorry. I think no, the internet went down for a second or two and then it uh, kicked me off well i thought here we are saying goodbye to to the absent artist but um you know i wonder if this is a good good time we're nearly at eight o'clock um to thank you for just this incredibly generous engagement with us um lots to keep talking about and um i would i'm very very hopeful and um I don't know, desirous of having you as part of, uh, to join us again at Columbia. We weren't even able to um, sit and eat with you and drink with you and have the kind of basic hospitality of thanking somebody who um, has given so much of, of themselves. So um, to be continued indeed, but thank you so, so very much for joining us today and for kicking off uh, the ICLS annual conference. It's a, it's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you so much.